Hello, and welcome to today's session. Today we're going to be talking about visual anatomy and visual physiology. In previous sections, we've talked about the anatomy and the physiology within the eyeball, and now we're going to move outside of the eyeball down to the next stage in the visual process. So we'll be talking about a portion of the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, or LGN. We'll look at those projections and the phenomenon of color opponency. After that, we'll go to the primary visual cortex and we'll talk about its structure. We'll also talk about the primary visual cortex and individual cells. So again, we'll talk about the lateral geniculate nucleus. This is a portion of the thalamus. Later on in the semester, we'll be talking about the medial geniculate nucleus as contrasted with the lateral geniculate nucleus. And we'll have that conversation when we talk about the anatomy and physiology of the ear. But right now, we're in the visual sense, so we'll be talking about the relevant portion of the thalamus, which would be the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN. Some projections, and also color opponency. So here's a fairly busy diagram or two, and what we'll do is we'll trace the visual information beyond the retinal ganglion cells along the optic nerve, cranial nerve number two. So just to orient us, we remember from a prior lecture that light travels in straight lines, at least until it gets to some kind of refracting medium, maybe like a lens. So in this diagram, we have an individual who's sticking their thumb out. This would be the person's right thumb, and excuse my back. The right thumb is now going to be projecting to the left side of each of the two eyes. We're going to develop just a little bit of terminology to understand the left and right sides of our eyes. We typically call the side nearest the ears the temporal side and the side nearest the nose, the nasal side. So in this particular case, we have an individual who might be looking straight ahead and reading a sample, perhaps a textbook, on sensation and perception. And their right thumb is going to be projecting to the temporal side of the left eye and the nasal side of the right eye. In each case, note that the thumb is projecting to the left side of each eye, but that has a temporal consequence on the left eye. Here it's a nasal consequence on the right eye. And the fovea, again, is going to be the central portion of each retina. What we're going to do is trace these out from the eye. We talked about the ganglion cells within the retina the last time. We'll make our way on down to the lateral geniculate nucleus. And here we're just going to remind ourselves that as we're talking about this optic nerve, and we said previously the optic nerve would comprise the axons of the ganglion cells. That's one of many different kinds of nerves that we have in the brain. There's actually 12 pairs of nerves in the brain. We can call these the cranial nerves. And we're talking about the optic nerve, which happens to be, according to anatomical convention, the second of the 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Later on this semester, we're going to be talking about the auditory sense. And when we do that, we're going to be talking about the eighth cranial nerve, which you see here as the vestibulococular nerve. So for right now, we're on the optic nerve, and we're trying to pick up the projections from what's coming out of the retina, specifically what's coming from the ganglion cell axons that we call the optic nerve. OK, the temporal projections, that is, those projections which are nearest to the ears, stay, if you will, on their side. But the nasal projections, that's those closest to the nose, are going to crisscross at a structure called the optic chiasm. Just to give you a little bit of background in terminology, when we have a series of projections anatomically that, if you will, stay on their side, we call those ipsilateral projections. And when we have others that are crisscrossing over to the other side of the brain, we call those contralateral projections. Okay? So we have this projection of the temporal uh, components staying on their side, but the nasal projections crisscrossing at the optic chiasm. I'll show you that in just a moment. After the optic chiasm, the optic nerve is called the optic tract. For those of us who are in Granville, Ohio, and we know something about the roads here in Granville, you might think of this in, a, in the following Granvillian way. And that is that right in front of our college, we have Broadway. Uh, and Broadway eventually becomes uh, Dublin Granville Road if you take it to the east. And if you take it to the west, uh, it becomes, I think it's Route 16 or so. The point is, it's all one continuous tract, but the name changes as you go from town to town. The same thing is true, in a way, of these 
visual projections. We call the visual projections by one name up until a certain point, and when they cross over metaphorically into another portion of the town or a different town, that same street might change names. This is very much the case when we talk about uh, the optic nerve traveling up to the optic chiasm. Thereafter, it becomes the optic tract. Later on, we'll see that beyond that point, it even becomes optic radiations. Always the same projection stream, but changing names slightly. And we'll see those a few different times. Okay? So there is a left and right optic tract. Each projects to its respective portion of the lateral geniculate nucleus with uh, abbreviated LGN and within the thalamus. Again, we can think of the thalamus as a relay station, as we've talked about several times in this course. Okay, so here's a diagram of all of that. Sometimes it helps to see things first in words and then to pull it together with a picture. We can have something off to this person's right side. We're going to be projecting to the left side of each eye. And as you can see over here, we have the optic nerve. Okay. We're going to get a crisscross at the optic chiasm. That's this X-like structure right over here. We call that the chiasm. And then after the chiasm, those same roads, if you will, are now called the optic tract here and here. And then we come to these structures that are shown in an almost oval-like diagram, a portion of the thalamus called the lateral geniculate nucleus, LGN. And then after that, what we're going to see later on, these processes that are coming out are going to be called optic radiations. And we'll make it all the way back here to our occipital lobe uh, in the primary visual cortex. Okay. So from the retina all the way to the cortex, a nice summary of our visual projections. Here's another diagram that says the same thing, and we'll have one more after this as well. What's nice about this is it's color-coded, and we can see the left visual field is in a reddish, orangish color. The right visual field is in more of a blue color, and we can see that the left side of this visual field is projecting to the right side of each retina, and again, this left visual field will project to the nasal side of the left eye, but the temporal side of the right eye, and conversely for this bluish uh, right visual field. And you can see that we have some kind of segregation uh, that in blue. Okay, So we'll take this blue projection, and it's coming over this way, and that's going to stay on its side. Okay? Whereas the red portions are going to crisscross over and wind up uh, in the contralateral side. Okay? So we have a case where the ipsilateral projections are staying on their own side. That's true over here in blue. That's true over here in orange. And the, um, the contralateral projections are going to cross over to the opposite uh, hemisphere. Okay. Here we are again, same kind of layout, but we get to see it now at a slightly higher view, still red on this side, blue on that side. We can see now the optic tract is neatly labeled. Okay. And this is now coming after the optic chiasm. We have the optic tract. Here we have the right lateral geniculate nucleus. And then that projection that goes from the LGN, or a portion of the thalamus, all the way back to our occipital lobe is labeled as the optic radiation. So same road, same projections, but changing names as it moves from town to town. OK. The lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN, has six layers, and they're very neatly organized. It's really quite spectacular, I think, to understand just how the brain is organized layer by layer of the cortex or layer by layer of a structure like the thalamus. Here we have the lateral geniculate nucleus, and there's uh, even precision within these six layers. For a given LGN, uh, uh, we can say that we have an LGN on the left side and on the right side. The ipsilateral, or same side, inputs project to layers 2, 3, and 5. Okay? So there's our word ipsilateral, meaning same side. Okay? And so we have the six layers to work with. You can think of this as a six-story building. And what's interesting about layers 2, 3, and 5 is they all have something in common. They're receiving their projections uh, coming out of the ganglion cells. And, and those are ganglion cells that are coming from the same side. Okay? So you can think of 2, 3, and 5 as adding up to, or 2 plus 3 adds up to 5. That's my little mnemonic. Okay? And that's the same as what you would expect from arithmetic. Uh, ipsilateral means same. If we do 2 plus 3, we get 5. This is my little memory trick. Um, we don't get that nice mathematical relationship, though, over here in the contralateral side. We get something contrary to what you would expect from simple addition. For a given LGN, that is either the left LGN or the right LGN, contralateral inputs, inputs from the oppositely sided eye, 
project to layers 1, 4, and 6. So we can see that we have a six layer structure. All six layers are accounted for here, but the projections are exceedingly orderly. If the projections to a given LGN, we'll say my right LGN, are coming from uh, the same side out in space, they're going to project to layers 2, 3, and 5. If they're coming from the contralateral side, they're going to project to layers 1, 4, and 6. So we can see this by diagram, sometimes a picture, we'll say a thousand words. Here we have our two eyes, okay, and let's say that we have something over here in this person's left-hand side, it's going to pre be projecting to the right side of each eye. In that particular case, this stimulus in your left visual field will project to the, the nasal side of the left eye and the temporal side of the right eye, okay? So now out comes the optic nerve. We get some crisscrossing when necessary at the optic chiasm, okay? And then we can look at the six layer structure that we have here. This would be a cartoon of the right hemisphere's lateral geniculate nucleus. And we can see the six structures. And what you can see is these darker dots are now on the uh, contralateral side. And they're going in, into layers one, four, and six. Okay, so they're coming from uh, the left eye. And this is the right LGN. So this left to right makes it a contralateral arrangement. And over here, we have the temporal projections, which are going to remain ipsilateral. Okay? And we can see that here, these open circles are projecting to open circles in two, three, and five, those layers. And as we said a moment ago, our little mnemonic is two plus three make five. That's the same as what you would expect. Same as, as in same side. Okay? Whereas one, four, and six, one plus four doesn't add up to six, that would be one and four adding up to six would be contrary to what you would think. And so this is a nice little mnemonic and it represents all of this cortical and uh, subcortical organization that we see here. Okay. So very, very organized uh, visual projections. Okay, we can say more about the organization of the lateral geniculate nucleus, nucleus and we'll, we'll learn that there are some important principles that are first evident to us in the LGN but some of these principles will, again, rear their heads as we make our way all the way back to the cortex. And then later in the, uh, in the semester, when we talk about hearing, we'll talk about other cortical structures and other uh, precortical structures that uh, exhibit some of these same properties. Neighboring areas of the lateral geniculate nucleus correspond to neighboring areas on the retina. And so the LGN is therefore said to be retinotopic. Let's all say that together, retinotopic. What this means is that the LGN is preserving a map-like structure where similar areas or nearby areas on the LGN correspond to nearby areas on the retina. What's really nice about that is because light travels in straight lines, nearby areas on the retina correspond to nearby areas out there in space. So we have really a very nice and very orderly mapping from space to the retina, all the way out to the LGN, one of the relay stations that we come to before we make our way all the way out to the occipital lobe, where the primary visual cortex is. So retinotopic. When we come to the conversation on hearing, we'll talk about how the auditory cortex isn't uh, retinotopic, obviously, but it is tonotopic. There is a orderly map of tones. Here we have an orderly map of space said to be retinotopic. Okay, let's see if we can understand that now, not just by words, but by diagram. So out here in the real world, in the distal stimulus, we can be looking at a particular region of space that we're calling A, and maybe our eyes are fixated on point A, and then we can have stimulus B, C, D, and E moving off to the left. Okay? As these stimuli are positioned off to the left from our current fixation point, we're going to have each of those project to relatively rightward sections of each eye, and as we've said a couple of times, if this E is on our left, it will project to the right-hand side. And for the right eye, that's going to be an ipsilateral projection. For the left eye, that's going to be a contralateral projection. Okay? So we can now see this very orderly arrangement here in space is reflected in a very orderly manner here inside of the LGN. In this particular case, we have a right LGN and we can see that this feed is coming in from the contralateral side, it's landing in layer one. This feed is coming in from the ipsilateral side, it's landing in layer two. So just two of these six layers are shown here, but it does help us appreciate the orderly relationship between 
that sequence within the LGN and this sequence out here in the real world. Sometimes we can uh, better see where the projections are coming from if we also keep track of these little prime indications. Here's E prime, D prime, C prime, B prime, A prime. Those are making their way on down here where we have the primes in this particular layer, no prime. So very orderly projections. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the different kinds of cell types that we might have. Many cells in the LGN exhibit something called center surround antagonism based on color. Just to harken back to something that we've learned about previously, in our earlier sections on biological information processing, we talked about this center surround antagonism and we had areas of light that we had signified by plus signs, areas that surrounded that, um, that represented uh, light decrements, we signified those by minus signs. So we can have an opponency between higher levels of light, light increments, and uh, lower levels of light, light decrements. We can have the same kind of center surround antagonism, but now not just in luminance levels, but also in different wavelengths of light. And to use the psychological equivalent of that, we can talk about colors. So we might have some center surround antagonism in these cells in the relay station that are based on color rather than on luminance. So some of these cells have an opponency that isn't so much dark light, but it might be red-green. Other cells might have an opponency that's blue-yellow, and we do have some cells that have simple dark light opponency. So we have almost three different varieties of opponency. Dark light, which is something very familiar to us by now, and now we're introducing some color opponency, and for our species and for, this, for those species that are our nearest genetic neighbors, red-green is a very common kind of opponency, and blue-yellow is a very common kind of opponency. These have very interesting line lineages phylogenically, that is, if you went back in time through the generations, uh, this red-green opponency is a phylogenically, that is, evolutionarily, slightly more recent mechanism than is the blue-yellow opponency. As we've seen before, other LGNs are simply luminance opponent, not color opponent. So we'll take a look at this fairly colorful picture. Okay? And here we'll do some red-green opponency up top. And we can see that we have a red surround and a green center. Over here we have the complementary arrangement. We have a red center and a green surround. But these two pairs constitute the cell types that would help us with red-green opponency. We'll learn about some different kinds of structures, uh, different kinds of cells, I should say, within the LGN, a designation that we might call parvocellular cells, and that's characteristic of these red-green cells. Uh, they participate in a cell classification that we call parvocellular, okay? red-green opponency. There's another kind of parvocellular set that is color opponent, and it's blue-yellow. Here we have a blue center, yellow surround. Here we have the opposite configuration, yellow center, blue surround. And these color opponent varieties are frequently classified as being parvocellular. By the way, anatomically, these tend to be a little bit smaller, uh, very interestingly. We have other kinds of cells that we call magnocellular cells. These are a little bit larger, and they tend not to be color opponent but they are luminance opponent, and we've seen this before. We've seen that we have cells in the uh, retinal ganglion area that are light center off surround. Okay. Others are dark center off surround. We call these off center cells, on center cells, and so forth. The so same kind of an idea is just applied either to color or to luminance. Okay, color opponent LGN cells help to identify color-based edges. When we described J.J. Gibson's thought exercise previously, we had some conversation about the importance of heterogeneous light, not just having stimulation, but having stimulus information, being able to reduce the uncertainty about what's where and where the boundaries are in the real world. And most objects in the real world have luminance boundaries relative to other objects. The same thing is true with colors. So today I'm deliberately wearing a bright yellow shirt and black pants. So uh, if you could see, and I don't know if you can get all of me in there, there's a nice boundary between my shirt and my pants. There's a luminance difference there. There's also a color difference. Okay? So these color opponent LGN cells can help us find boundaries out there that are color defined separately from those that are luminance defined. So we might have red berries on green leaves. This might be a very evolutionarily relevant color pairing out there in the real world. And these LGN cells will help us find those boundaries. Cells within the lateral geniculate nucleus 
uh, project via the optic radiations, as we've mentioned before, all the way out to the primary visual cortex. So let's do it from the point of visual space all the way back to our visual cortex. We might have some object over here on this person's right. It will project to the left side of each retina. We can see the uh, projections coming out of the ganglion cells. We called those before the optic nerve, our second cranial nerve, making their way to this crisscross that we called the optic chiasm. After the optic chiasm, that same road, so to speak, now is called the optic tract, and it's going to make its way into the lateral geniculate nucleus for the visual sense later on the semester, the medial geniculate nucleus for the auditory sense. And here we are in the LGNs, this person's right LGN or their left LGN. And then we get more projections, more axons coming out all the way back to the visual cortex. We call these the optic radiations. Okay, so that tells us a little bit about the anatomy and a tad about the physiology, this color opponency of uh, some of the cell types in the early visual pathway. Now what we'll do is talk a little bit about the primary visual cortex, uh, its structure, and some cell types and so forth. Okay. So the primary visual cortex is located all the way back here in our occipital lobes. Uh, and I think we've talked about the occipital lobe many times in prior sessions, so this is something that's familiar to you. The primary visual cortex goes by many different names that you will see throughout the semester. And you might see, after you've completed this course, you might see these references in news uh, write-ups or maybe in scientific journals. This primary visual cortex is sometimes called striate cortex. It's sometimes called area V1, and V here stands for visual. Another anatomical classification was the Brodmann classifications, and this would be Brodmann's area 17. So we have different ways of referring to exactly the same. Just as a reminder, Earlier in this semester, we talked a little bit about being optically blind. That is to say that there might be a problem with phototransduction. Maybe somebody has lost photoreceptors. But people can become blind for a variety of reasons. Maybe the connections from the retina to the thalamus have been severed. That would make a person blind. We can also be cortically blind. And this is something that happens occasionally when we have stroke or maybe a car accident or a biking accident and we have a lesion to some portion of the cortex. Okay, V1 is organized in a topographic uh, fashion, and we might use this in a similar way as we use the word retinotopic. For our purposes, we can use those, those two terms synonymously. Okay. So we're going to be preserving the spatial relationships from out here in space uh, to our retina through the LGN. There's going to be a nice spatial organization even inside of our cortex. The left visual field maps to the right V1, or the right primary visual cortex. Conversely, the right visual field maps to the left V1. If I can pause here and just give you a caution about a commonly made error. Some people think that, erroneously, that the left eye maps to the right visual cortex and the right eye maps to the left visual cortex. This is typically a mistake that's made by, for example, Psych 100 students when they're learning something about the contralateral organization of our nervous system. And there is a lot of contralaterality in our nervous system. That's certainly true, but what we can say is that it's really a matter of the left visual field mapping to the right cortex and the right visual field mapping to the left cortex. Okay? It's not left eye, right eye, it's left visual field, right visual field. Okay? So uh, the upper visual field maps to the lower portion of V1 and the lower visual field maps to the upper portion of V1. So this is now along the vertical expanse. We still have some organization uh, and a very orderly relationship between what's going on in space and what's going on in our cortex. Okay, like the LGN, area V1 overrepresents the fovea. So this is something that we've alluded to, but I'd like to unpack now. It's the case that from our retina through the LGN all the way back here to the primary visual cortex, we don't have equal representation for all regions of space. Whatever it is that we're fixating on, when we're moving our point of focus and we're bringing our fovea onto some stimulus in the real world, we typically have greater neural machinery dedicated to our fovea than we do to more peripheral regions of our retina. And that principle of unequal representation is true not only in the retina, but in subsequent stages, like the thalamic LGN, or lateral geniculate nucleus, or all the way back in to our cortex. We call this cortical magnification. That is to say that we have, if you will, a magnified level of representation 
for the central portions of our vision called the fovea and less so for the more peripheral components. This diagram makes that point and through the years some students have struggled a little bit with this diagram. So let's see if we can unpack it a bit by bit. The upper portions of this correspond to the retinal image. In this particular layout the fovea is here. Okay, so this is the center of your gaze and we have some stimulus, a checkerboard if you will, that's extending away from your fovea. We can then ask how is this represented in the cortex? Okay? And the size of these different check marks that you see will correspond to the area of cortex that's dedicated to analyzing that region of the fovea or the retina. Okay? So here we have uh, on this diagram, it's on our upper right side, it's just above the fixation point, we have a black box. We have a relatively large black box here and this large size is meant to convey the notion that we have a fairly large region of cortex dedicated to analyzing that relatively small region of fovea. As you move out to what would be your left in this diagram, you can see that we have smaller and smaller regions of cortex dedicated to increasingly peripheral regions of the fovea, uh, excuse, uh, of, the, of the retina. The fovea would be right here. These are more peripheral regions of your retina and we're getting less and less cortical representations. One way of thinking about this is that we have less precision or less acuity for the greater and more peripheral regions of our retina. Okay, okay. so that was an introduction that took us all the way up to the primary visual cortex and we got to see some general principles about this cortex. How it's organized left to right, top to bottom, how we have an unequal distribution. What we're going to do now is zoom in just a little bit and see if we can talk about individual cells within the uh, primary visual cortex. Okay, and to help guide us we'll set the stage first by giving you a heads up that we're going to be talking about three major cell types and there are many more kinds of cells than these three but I think for our purposes understanding how these three kinds of cells differ from each other uh, this will give us a really good understanding about the relationship I think between um, neurological processing and our psychological experiences. So we'll start out with these three cell types. As we move through the semester we might introduce additional cell types but these three are frequently learned first. So three classes of cells that we w widely recognize. The types are distinguished from each other by their receptive field properties. Remember that we can think of a receptive field in a very general sense as the range of stimuli to which a cell responds. In the visual sense we might think of it as the region of space to which the cell responds. But then we can also zoom in further and talk about particular kinds of features that a cell might respond to. And this will help us to understand these three different classes of cortical cells. Okay? Uh, let's get their names first. Some of the classifications are such that a cell is labeled a simple cell. Others are called complex cells. And then finally we have hypercomplex cells. And these refer approximately to the sequence in which these cells have been found by folks like Hubel and Wiesel who won a Nobel Prize in 1981 for their work on visual physiology. We had seen these folks in a prior session where we talked a little bit about theories of visual perception and a little bit about the history of visual perception. I'd also like to give you another thumbs up, uh, another heads up, excuse me. Uh, the heads up is that I think that these words are a little bit misleading. It's not really the case that a simple cell is simpler than a complex cell. Okay? Uh, and it's not really the case that a complex cell is less complex than a hypercomplex cell. But these were the labels that folks like Hubel and Wiesel and other visual physiologists had given to these different kinds of cells. And for historical continuity, to this day we do retain this, this terminology. So I wouldn't take these labels to heart, but they are helpful uh, just in understanding that we have different kinds of cells. So let's discuss each in turn. We'll start out with the simple cells. Simple cells have subdivisions within their receptive fields, just like the LGN cells, just like the ganglion cells all the way back in the retina. So this is something that's a familiar, um, uh, familiar concept to you. The subdivisions are such that the cells respond to stimuli in a position sensitive manner, 
within their receptive fields. And we'll understand position sensitivity in just a moment. I do want to plant a seed, and that is that we're going to soon learn that this idea of position sensitivity will also be related to something called phase sensitivity in the frequency domain when we learn about the frequency domain in a couple of sessions. So I'm just planting a seed now that there's some relationship between position sensitivity and something called phase sensitivity. So uh, for this reason, simple cells are said to be phase sensitive or positionally sensitive, uh, and their response, their inclination to put out action potentials, will depend on how a particular stimulus is positioned within the, within the, the visual field. So here, you can see that we have something akin to the ganglion cell receptive fields we had seen before, the LGN receptive fields that we had seen just a few slides back. We might have an on-center and off-surrounds, Previously, we had these donut kinds of configurations that were perfectly circular. Now what we have is the emergence of some orientation selectivity. So in the diagrams that I'll show you here, we have mostly vertically uh, oblong receptive field components. And this cell is going to have an on center, shown here by the positive, and off flanks or off surrounds. And it's more or less vertically oriented. These simple cells have these kinds of subfields, off, on, off, Okay. And we can ask, what kind of stimuli would these cells quote-unquote like? What kinds of stimuli would drive the cell to fire the most? Okay. And the answer would be something like this. We have a region of dark, a region of light, a region of dark. This portion of our stimulus is irrelevant because it's not landing in this cell's receptive field. But here we have dark, light, dark, and that's a pretty good match to this cell's receptive field configuration. So we might say informally that this cell will love this stimulus, which is to imply that it will put out many action potentials. Through the miracle of PowerPoint, we can now just change the relative position of this stimulus. We can change its phase, so to speak. By phase, we mean relative position. I'm going to slide this thing over. Ah, there it goes. And now we have a bit of a mismatch. Remember that we preferred off on, off, but we now have this light increment landing in the off region, and that's not a good match. We have this light decrement, or black region, landing in the cell's on center. That's not a good match. And we have another off region over here, but we have a light increment landing there. So this is now a kind of stimulus that this cell is going to hate. It's going to stop firing because we have a mismatch between its receptive field configuration, and how light is distributed out here in the real world. So we have this mismatch, the cell stops, but if I move it back, ah, the cell starts firing, I've changed the position of the stimulus, it shuts up, I move it back, it starts going, I move it over, and it stops one more time. Okay? So this would be now an uh, on-center variety. Okay? A simple cell's response depends on the stimulus position, so it's said to be uh, phase sensitive in something called the frequency domain, as I've mentioned. Uh, we'll learn about that in a few sessions. By contrast, a complex cell's response is not positionally sensitive. So, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, I'm not sure this makes the cell less complex in any relevant semantic way, but there are these cells that we call complex cells that are not positionally sensitive. Okay? So complex cells do not have distinct on versus off regions. Let's take a look at how this might be. We do have different flanks, like we see here. And what's important is that the luminance level here is different from this and different from this in order to drive the cell. Okay? That we need to have some kind of distinct subregions. But the actual differences in terms of their position will not matter. Let's see if we can understand that by way of stimulus. We can ask, what would drive this complex cell? And this would drive the complex cell. So, so far, these two cell types are looking the same. This complex cell seems to be operating like the simple cell until we perform this experimental manipulation. This cell responds really well to this stimulus. Then I change the phase. And unlike the simple cells, this cell responds also to this phase or relative position. So for this particular cell, we don't care whether the stimulus is positioned like this or shifted something along these lines, okay, back and forth, we get a lot of firing for either of these stimuli. So this is said to be a phase independent or a positionally independent cell. And we call that kind of a cell a complex cell. So the simple cells were positionally dependent. These are positionally independent. Simple cells were uh, phase sensitive. These are phase insensitive. What the cell does require is that the central area 
differs in its luminance from the flanking or surrounding areas. So we still have to have some luminance contrast. But we don't care about the direction of that luminance contrast. It could be either on-center or off-surround. Uh, on-center, off-surround, or off-center, on-surround. Okay, so complex cells differ from simple cells uh, in that only simple cells are position sensitive, and we might call that phase sensitivity. So that's the distinguishing characteristic between those two cell varieties. Simple and complex cells are similar to each other in that they don't care about stimulus length. So the length of a stimulus is not a property that we've introduced to this point in our conversation. But this now gives us the chance to segue into the so-called hypercomplex cells. So hypercomplex cells do care about, that is, they do respond to stimuli in a length-specific manner. So let's see if we can understand that. Some hypercomplex cells have heterogeneous receptive fields, and, and they might be positionally sensitive. Uh, here we have on-center, off-surrounds. Okay. <clears throat> Others might uh, not really care about that. They don't really care whether we have um, the darkness in the center or the lightness in the center. So this bit about positional sensitivity is not relevant to describing the hypercomplex cells. What is relevant is this notion called end stopping or length selectivity. So all hypercomplex cells are end stopped. Okay, let's take a look at what we mean by that. So we're back to a very familiar kind of diagram. Notice that the ends of this stimulus, its top and its bottom, for example, stop within the receptive field. At least for this vertically oriented cell, we can say that, uh, that the end of that stimulus falls within this receptive field. But if I were to change the stimulus in this way and go like that, now the stimulus is extending beyond the range of the cell's receptive field. And what happens here is this cell will now stop firing. So this cell will fire to this stimulus, and it will fire, uh, stop firing to that stimulus. So now these cells are beginning to convey some information, which is to say these cells will begin to reduce some uncertainty about how large things are out there in the real world. Not only where are they positioned, which is something we might get from simple cells, and not only are, do we have light than dark or dark than light, we might have gotten that from even complex cells um, and so forth. Um, what we can say here, though, is we're getting some length selectivity. Okay? So another way of conveying some features of the visual world by firing rates, in this case, firing rates of hypercomplex cells. Okay? So that was the concept of end stopping. End stopping or length selectivity is defined as is the defining characteristic of hypercomplex cells. Okay? So let's see if we can summarize these three cell types. We've talked about a lot of new ideas here. Again, big picture ideas. We have simple cells, complex cells, hypercomplex cells. Okay? They have some different properties. What distinguishes simple, comp simple cells from complex cells is this position sensitivity, sometimes called phase sensitivity. Simple cells are positionally sensitive, whereas complex cells are not. Hypercomplex cells can be either of these. This is not a relevant feature in defining the, the hypercomplex cells, but their unique property is that they are end stopped. That is, they are selective for length. End stopping is the phraseology that our early visual physiologists had used, uh, and neither of these other two cell, uh, cell types exhibit end stopping or length selectivity. So a nice table summarizing how these three cell types are distinct one from the next. Okay, many V1 cells um, of any type, whether they're complex cells, hypercomplex cells, simple cells, respond to inputs from the two eyes. So uh, we have some cells that are monocularly driven, and a monocularly driven cell is one that's driven only by the activity in one eye. But now for the first time in the visual pathway, we have individual cells that are receiving inputs from the two eyes. Up to this point, through the lateral geniculate nucleus, we've had this monocular segregation of inputs. Uh, the, the cell would be innervated or would receive axons from just one eye or the other, but not both. Now, we get uh, some binocular convergence. Inputs from the two eyes are finally now landing on the dendrites of one cell in the primary visual cortex, and this binocularity makes it possible to have stereoscopic depth. Stereoscopic depth is a particular kind of depth perception. And we're going to be talking a lot about depth perception later on this semester. But there's a very specific type of depth perception that arises solely from the difference between the two retinal images. When we look out at the world with one eye and then the other eye, we get two slightly different images. And some of these cells that are binocular cells uh, can help us difference those two images and recover some depth information. Okay? V1 is also the earliest point 
in the visual pathway that responds differentially to orientations. Here's a vertical orientation, here's a horizontal orientation. Ganglion cells in our retina are not orientationally selective. Cells in the lateral geniculate nucleus, that's the next stop along our pathway, those aren't orientationally selective. For our species, orientation selectivity originates for the first time all the way back here in the primary visual cortex. Orientation selectivity is a property of almost all V1 cells, and we even get the emergence of some direction selectivity. So as a stimulus moves from this side to that side, we might get some cells firing. Other cells will prefer motion from this side to that side. Still other cells will prefer upward or downward motion and so forth. Uh, area V1 has some tuning to direction. Uh, although it's relatively crude tuning, we get better tuning in a subsequent area called MT, or the medial temporal area. Okay? All right, so let's just remind ourselves of what a tuning curve might look like. Here we get the cell's response. Up top we have a lot of responding. Down at the bottom we have very low levels of, of responding. And out here in the environment we can systematically manipulate the orientation of a stimulus. Here's a vertical orientation. This cell loves to respond to vertical orientations. As we systematically manipulate the orientation of our stimulus we might get a diminution of our firing rates, either on this side or that side of the vertical. Okay, so we now can say that this cell is not only orientationally tuned, but we might say that this cell is tuned specifically to verticals, others will like uh, horizontals and so forth. This orientation tuning is something that you might see in simple cells and complex cells and hypercomplex cells. Uh, we get a lot of orientation tuning in V1. Okay. So I will not give you the answer to this. We'll see how you respond to this potential pop quiz question. What is the oblique effect behaviorally, and what is its neural basis? So here's a little diagram that you might remember from your reading, and in class we'll see if we can answer this potential pop quiz question. Okay, let's see if we can begin to wrap up today's conversation by talking about a really interesting phenomena, um, and one that we will return to many, many times throughout the semester, the issue of after effects. And there are all kinds of after effects. In this simple example, we'll be talking about a tilt after effect because we've just introduced the notion of orientation tuning. So tilt, or changes in orientation, will be a relevant variable for this particular diagram and for our conversation today. Hopefully you've got this printed out right in front of you, and you might want to zoom in very closely on your printed notes and take a look at what we have up here. This is our test stimulus, and it's simply a visual stimulus that has vertically oriented bars. Very finely um, spaced, vertically oriented bars. That's our test stimulus. And that's the stimulation that we have. Right. Here we have a panel essentially of tuning curves that we had seen back over here. And these tuning curves are such that we can say some cells are preferring this orientation. Right. Some cells are preferring that orientation. In the center, we have the tuning of a neuron that's preferring the vertical orientation. So we have an ensemble of neurons and the receptive fields. And they're showing you, basically, sensitivity to a full complement of different orientations. That's what this ensemble is doing. Okay? So we now are taking the stimulus, and we're running it through this ensemble. And because the stimulus is vertically oriented, we're going to get maximum responding from our visual neuron that's tuned to verticals, and we'll get a little bit less responding from those that are tuned slightly off of vertical. We'll get even less responding from those that are further away from vertical, and so on down the line. We get almost a bell-shaped distribution of responses with the peak corresponding to what kind of stimulus is out there in the world. In this case, we have a vertical stimulus. We're getting predominantly vertically tuned cells responding uh, in our primary visual cortex. And what we get as a result of this physiological activity is some kind of psychological experience down here. A psychological experience is the perception of vertically oriented bars, just like we have in the test stimulus. So our perception is corresponding very nicely to what's going on out here. Now comes the manipulation. The experimental manipulation is that for a few minutes we can have the person now adapt to a grading similar to the one that we had before, but not identical. The experimental manipulation is a manipulation in orientation. We're going to take the vertical orientation, tilt it a little bit this way, and you'll notice on your diagrams that we now have an adapting stimulus that might be about 30 degrees clockwise of vertical. Okay? And we have them adapt to that, which is to say stare at that for something like maybe a minute, a minute and a half or so. And then we bring back the initial test. This test stimulus is back to being vertical. 
and we now present that vertical stimulus to the same nervous system that we had a moment ago, but now that nervous system will be exhibiting some adaptation. That is to say, this nervous system will have reduced sensitivity to the adapting stimulus orientation. So we're getting now fewer action potentials from those particular orientations that are consistent with this adapting stimulus. It's almost as if these cells have begun to fatigue after one and a half minutes of prolonged exposure to that stimulus. And so now, instead of having a nice even panel of responses to orientation, we have a skewed panel. We have greater sensitivity to this side than we do to that side of this orientation spectrum. Because we have this kind of a skew in our sensitivities, the cell's response to that stimulus, which it had seen a moment ago, is now going to reflect that skew that arises from this adaptation manipulation. And we now get not predominant firing at the vertical, but we get predominant firing off of vertical. Not because the stimulus isn't vertical, the stimulus is vertical, but we've changed now the relative sensitivity of our orientationally tuned mechanisms. Because we've introduced this skew in the physiology, we now have a skew in our psychological experience. So this shows a really nice tie between the physiological response and our psychological experience. We're typically going to now perceive a grating that's oriented away from vertical, and in fact, in a direction that's opposite to the tilt of the adapting stimulus. So this is uh, a nice example of an after effect. In this particular case, it's a tilt after effect. In the future, we'll see other kinds of after effects, including color after effects and after effects relating to size. Okay, within the cortex, orientations are very neatly organized into what we would call orientation columns. Similarly, cortical cells are also neatly organized in what we would call ocular dominance columns. A given cell might be more influenced by, say, the left eye's input than the right eye's input. So we do have a few cells in the primary visual cortex that are driven or innervated entirely by the left eye. Those are monocular cells, monocular one eye only. Others might be monocularly driven by the right eye. Other cells are binocular cells. They're driven by both eyes, but maybe not by both eyes equally. A given cell might be receiving more inputs from the left eye than from the right eye, or conversely, right eye than the left eye. And this difference we can think of as an ocular dominance difference. A complete set of orientation columns and, ocular, uh, and ocularity for a given retinal location is called a hypercolumn. Okay? So we've taken a lot of these features, we begin to roll them up, and it turns out that our cortex is organized this way. The lighter areas correspond to inputs coming from the left eye. The darker areas correspond to inputs coming from the right eye. And what we've done is taken a little slab of your primary visual cortex and we've drawn it in cartoon. And we can see that we now have a left eye driven area, predominantly left eye driven, predominantly right eye driven, and those two are going to uh, make up a ocular dominance column. And within that ocular dominance column, you might see along a different dimension that we have orientation preferences that are changing as we move our electrode through different portions of this slab of cortex. And then we come to another ocular dominance column where we have predominantly left eye, predominantly right eye uh, representation. Okay, so that was a lot of information on visual physiology and visual anatomy. What I hope you'll do, as always, is think back to those different sections that we described and maybe make a note or two about what you thought was particularly clear. And we'll have some conversation about that. Also, equally importantly, please make sure that you make a note of what was not so clear and what questions you might want to have answered during class. See you in class.